The purpose of this presentation is to introduce you to media literacy. How many of you have taken courses in media literacy before? Raise your hand. Is it working, the translation? Yes, okay. So whether you've taken courses before or you have not, I want you to take a moment and use the pad and the paper. Everybody has a column, Waraka. Everybody's got paper and pen. Yes? So take your pen and paper and write your own definition of media literacy, regardless if it's something you learned or just something that you think, okay? And keep that definition with you. We're gonna use it for an activity at the end. So I'll give you one minute, very quickly. It doesn't have to be, I'm not looking for a critical reflection essay. You don't need to have citations. Just write a very brief definition of media literacy. In English or in Arabic. Okay, a very brief definition of media literacy. Everybody's got one? I'll quickly introduce myself. My name's Dr. Gretchen King. I teach here at LAU. I have for one year. And some of the content that I'll be showing you today is content I use in my classes to teach critical media literacy skills to students who are studying performing arts, journalism, TV film, and communication. My background has been several decades working as a media activist, both within the Independent Media Center, which was the first online user-generated platform launched in 1999 before YouTube, before Twitter, and it did not collect user data and went to court several times to defend the fact that it did not collect user data. Recently, an Indie Media Center in, uh, in Germany was shut down over this issue of user data. It reopened, by the way. There's also community radio, which I've been part of for many decades as well, which I see as part of social movement media, which I will talk about in detail later. I did my PhD research in Jordan at Radio Balad, which you see the logo here. So my experiences my teaching, my learning about media literacy come from these media activists and media movement examples. And so some of the things I will be sharing with you today might be challenging because they speak about ideology and oppression in media. There's some content that might be offensive. There's some content that might not necessarily fit within your beliefs, but I am driving a bus right now and you're all passengers and you can decide which stops you want to get off of, uh, get out of and explore around. And if you don't like the stop, you don't really have to go there. You just stay on the bus and I'll drive you to the next stop, okay? So this is a bus ride. Hopefully it's fun, hopefully it's interesting, and hopefully it's a moment in which you can participate as much as me. And so it's critical that you participate in this discussion because it's a discussion, it's not a lecture. We're gonna watch some clips of videos and think about some theories that I teach in my classes, and we're gonna have a discussion about this content among ourselves. So I will not be doing all the talking, okay? And keep your definition handy. Do not recycle that piece of paper. So just quickly, we're gonna go through four main points today. I'm gonna to talk first about radical media education, ideology in media. We're gonna look at different examples of oppression in media. And we will reflect, revise, and review together. So I situate my approach to critical media literacy within some of the traditions you see above here. So we have Canadian scholars at the top. It's not because Canada is in part sponsoring this that they're included at the top. Um, but it is work that I draw on in my own scholarship. So these scholars think about critical media literacy not just as a kind of criticality, trying to teach 
students, uh, learners to be critical of media, but also to give them the tools to think about how media influences their lives socially and politically and to engage with that. So that's one place that I like to start from. Another place is the work of Jad Melki, which is in development and draws on the, the work of uh, Pavel Freire, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and it talks about a media literacy of the oppressed, where media literacy should not just draw on existing concepts, because a lot of media literacy is developed in the West, outside of this region, and then it's brought here and used the same. So he recommends in his work, and this was an editorial and a media education journal that you can look up, I have resources at the end. He suggests to reframe existing largely Western developed concepts and to adapt them to local issues, particularly problematizing the pro uh, problems of oppressed groups. So that's Melky's approach to media literacy of the oppressed. And he's here, he was just here. You can ask him more about that work or you can read the reference at the end of the slides. My own work is coming soon out in a book chapter called Radical Media Education. And this, this is developed not only on my own experience, but on my research. As I had mentioned, working at Radio Balad, I talked about how Radio Balad facilitates a radical pedagogical environment because a lot of community radio environments teach participants in community radio, as well as listeners, how to critique the media or to critique society, or to critique status quo politics. And a lot of community media also encourage listeners, participants, producers, to do something different. And Radio Balad's uh, mandate is actually to facilitate uh, democratic change in Jordan. It's written in their mandate. You can find their mission statement on their website. So they very much see themselves as part of transforming not only hegemonic media, but hegemonic practices in society. So I believe there is a area of media education that we need to go as practitioners. And part of that is to social movement media, is to media activism. We need to see and teach the kinds of media that activists are making, that social movements are circulating, so that we can inspire our students and empower them to develop their own media that will also similarly try to transform society. So that's how I define radical media education. Radical not because it's leftist or some specific type of politics, but radical because it's transformative, because it facilitates a change. It's not just a critique of media, we're trying to change hegemonic media, okay? So this is just some terminology that I wanted to introduce you to. And now we're gonna look at some of the resources that I've used in the classroom. And I decided to do this for two reasons today. One, I wanted to share with some of you who are either educators or future educators, the kinds of materials that I'm using to facilitate conversations with about some of these issues in the classroom. Because theory, theory is great, uh, but for undergraduates, they want to see the practice. They want to see how it applies. And so I found some resources to help students understand how can we take some of these critical theoretical concepts and apply it to media practice, apply it to changing the world. How many of you have heard of the scholar uh, Stuart Hall? Stuart Hall? Okay. I want to introduce you to him as a scholar. We'll talk about his work on ideology in a second. But by way of introducing you to Stuart Hall, I'm also going to be introducing you to a theory series that is available from a surprising source. It's called Media Theorized, and it was produced, I think, by an unemployed graduate student working uh, in media. Specifically, he was working at, Al or he or she were working, was working at Al Jazeera. And they produced this theory, uh, this Media Theory Theorized, Media Theorized series. And I don't know if it ever aired on Al Jazeera English, but it is, the complete series is available on YouTube, and they go through different media theories. Uh, they include Edward Said and Orientalism. Um, they talk about Roland Barthes. And this one that I wanna play with you, play for you now, is to introduce you to the idea and the work of Stuart Hall. 
Um, so this will have sound when I hit play. Everybody guarantees that? Fouad? Okay, let's see. No. It's too low. Ready? We see our reality through them, but these are not transparent operations. They involve the workings of power. Stuart Hall was an outsider, born in colonial Jamaica, educated in Oxford. He was out of place in both. He left academia, the literary canon, high culture, to become an intellectual of mass culture. What he did was controversial. He was looking at the power of mainstream media in representing race, gender, class, ethnicity, religion. Hall said those discourses are not innocent, that hidden in mass media is ideology. The media theory's job is to find that ideology, expose it, critique it. The media's racialization of crime, the patriarchal narratives on gender, the othering of immigrants, Muslims, the poor. The media are active agents in this process. What of the masses? The audience is watching. Hall broke with the presumption that the masses are dumb, passive. In fact, he questioned who the faceless masses even are. Some may accept the dominant meanings embedded in the media. Some may negotiate them. Others outright reject them. Where other media theorists argued that messages are imposed on people from above, Hall said power is not as simple as that. He saw pockets of resistance that undermine dominant media narratives. Think of the bloggers in Tunisia, the graffiti artists of Brazil, Black Lives Matter. But Hall went further. He also told us to seek out stories elsewhere in the lowly, despised spaces of knowledge. The gossip mags, the soap opera, the music videos. If you want to understand society, then maybe avoid the news. Those formalized spaces that house official discourse. Find different stories, different perspectives, different realities. So I do recognize there's something inherently ironic about Al Jazeera producing content such as this that says, please avoid the news. But they did, and like I said, I don't know if it ever aired, but it's useful in the media, in the critical media uh, education classroom. So Hall writes about ideology, and I have my students read from one of his textbooks about his work on ideology, so he wrote very clearly in a student accessible way about his theoretical approaches. And in this text, he deconstructs race in media. And so Hall says in this text that race is one of the most profoundly naturalized of ideologies in media. So media produced ideologies and race is profoundly naturalized. Now we can see here uh, cartoons from what comic? Does anybody know this comic? Just shout it out. Tintin, yeah, Tintin. So Tintin was racist and probably still is. If you look at the update, there hasn't been much change in the way people from Africa as a single continent, not a continent of many nations, are drawn. But this is one example of, of how media can produce overtly or inferently racist media. But why would Hall say something like this, that race is naturalized? Anybody have a guess? 
when it comes to media? If you have a guess, you have to raise your hand. And Manala is gonna pass you the microphone. Press the button and wait a second. What, there's a buzz. Can you cut the sound for a second or is that me? I need to do something. Anyway, go ahead, please. Maybe because uh, media is representing race it is as, as it would be something that makes a difference between people. For sure. Are people born with race or is race a category that's applied to them? The latter, right? Like we're not born raced people. People become racialized over time. These, among many other social categories that we're gonna be talking about now, are social constructions. They're not things we're born into. They are things that are constructed, and media help produce that. See what we're doing now? We're talking about theory, and we're applying it to media. And I wanna show you one example that I use in the classroom that's quite effective in terms of talking about how media constructs race. And this video that we're gonna watch now there are, there, there are some offensive clips, but they, they are pulled together purposely. It's produced by a Palestinian-Syrian filmmaker working on the, the great job that Jack Shaheen did reviewing thousands of movies from Hollywood. Is anybody familiar with this work, Real Bad Arabs? Just raise your hand if you are. So this is a review of Hollywood films since the beginning, since the first film, which featured a quote unquote Arab, a construction, right? A representation, not even a real Arab, not even real Arabic. So it's important in the classroom to be able to share examples when we wanna talk about racism in the media. Well, what examples can we look at beyond Tintin that show us racism in the media? And Hollywood, maybe surprising, maybe unsurprisingly for some of you, is a vast, vast uh, resource in terms of looking at racism in the media. So I'm gonna play for you uh, a piece. Her name is mentioned here, and you can have the link here if you get access to the slides, which I believe you will. This clip that I'm gonna show you is an extended trailer of a spoof movie that does not exist, okay? So it's, it's, a, it's a clip that feels like it's a trailer for a film that's real, and it even includes a, a review from, a new, from the New York Daily Post, but none of this is real. It's just her, this is an example of media activism that I use in the classroom to teach about racism. And we'll talk about it after, I'll just play it for you first. Dr. Amar, does it say what God's command is? To kill Americans. It's your government we fight, not you. It's your White House. One day I will go there. I will drive a truck. And drach it will be. You have killed our women and our children. Bombed our cities from afar like cowards. And you dare to call us terrorists? <laughs> Man of white sport. Husband. Yeah, I was. You didn't hear? She was in Paris showing the fall collection. She got hit by a burst of terrorist crossfire. Palestinians, French police. Oh my god. They found me. I don't know how, but they found me. Run for it, Marty! Who? Who? Who do you think? The Libyans! Holy shit! Attacking our way of life. Attacking our way of life. There's no 
borders, no customs. They can go anywhere in the U.S. There's nothing to stop them. Don't wander into the attic section, or you run into one of the grand Muftis gangsters and they'll kill you, sir. They'll slit your throat. Do you understand what I'm saying? American citizen. American citizen. Before we start drilling, where should we park the camels? American cowboy. You're looking at me. You're looking at country. You're looking at country. I don't know about you, but these guys make me nervous. <laughs> Mr. Lacombe said for me to tell you, um, camel jockeys, that if you fuck with him, he's gonna cut off your balls and stick them up your ass. You guys eat this shit? You're a dead man. I'm not afraid to die. Are you? No. Allah protects us. Well, then, this shouldn't hurt. <laughs> You're beginning to believe the illusions we're spinning here. You're beginning to think that the tube is reality and that your own lives are unreal. You do whatever the tube tells you. You dress like the tube, you eat like the tube, you raise your children like the tube, you even think like the tube. This is mass madness, you maniac. The president wants you to fly to Israel. Israel? Well, Israel is America's best friend in the Middle East, and it's only 20 minutes from Beirut. You're going to get anything and everything you want to do it right. You claim you belong to a revolutionary organization. That is correct. We are freedom fighters. We are fighting for our brothers. But then you don't want to be associated with Nazis who killed six million Jews. Not enough, lady. Not enough. The Jews stole Palestine. They took our lands. If you were alone without a gun, you wouldn't be shit. Shut up, you American imperialist pig. The Arabs are fanatics on the subject of Jewish immigration. Are you Jewish? Objection. As a Jew, isn't it your mission in life to destroy the lives of Muslims? Objection! You hate Muslims, don't you? Sidebar, Your Honor. They don't like Jews, huh, Mama? No, sweetie. They don't like Jews. I tell you, I would love, love to come to Israel, but I'm just so scared. You could bring world peace, Asi. You just go down the street, nobody will bother you. <laughs> nobody will fight. Oh, no, they'd blow us up. <laughs> A bullet in the desert is not unnatural, especially when there are so many gun runners and mercenaries about. Educated in the oh, U.S. Nice. What happened to you? I learned to love Allah. Allah Akbar. And, and what's the other one? Shuha. Shuhada. Right, that's it. The prayer before you give your life for God. It's an honor to die for Allah. Nice Mecca, pilgrim. <laughs> My country, women do not... In your country, you treat women like camels and send young boys to their deaths in the name of your excuse for a god. Ten years is a long time, Ali. It is a long time to resist the temptations of American society. 
I knew one day I'd be called upon to serve a greater good, to serve Allah. Please, Colonel, these people are sick and hungry. In the name of God, have mercy. Your God, not mine. I have a very important message for the leaders of the United States and the peoples of the world. You guys ought to nuke this fucking place off the map! feeling I just uh, fly in and frag the hell out of them, sir. You drop that bomb, you got my vote and the vote of every real American. See, listen, Mr. President, my buddy Ace and I were having this conversation the other day, and just out of nowhere, accidentally, I let slip the word fag. Well, my buddy gets all bent out of shape, saying, Ralphie, you gotta be careful, you don't know who's around, you know? And then he teaches me this little trick. Every time we see one of them homosexuals, we use the word watermelon. I said, geez, Ace, goddamn, that's ingenious. What do you call, what do you call blacks? He says, Texan. I said, what do you call uh, spics or Spanish folks? He says, uh, he says, truckers. And finally I say, well, what do you call them Arabs? He looks at me and he says, well, hell, Ralph, we just call them sand niggers. You see what I'm saying, Mr. President? Nobody gives a shit about no dirty ass sand nigger. And as far as their nukes goes, they're so stone age backwards, they've probably never even seen a button, let alone know how to push one. Turn off your television sets. Turn them off now. Turn them off right now. Turn them off and leave them off. Turn them off right in the middle of a sentence I'm speaking to you now. Turn them off! So again, based on the work of Jack Shaheen, who reviewed over a thousand Hollywood films, nearly all of them were negative portrayals, nearly all. And when Jack Shaheen asked Hollywood directors, why do you do this? They reportedly said, we only are producing what we see on the news. It's what we see on the news. And Jack Shaheen told them, but that's exceptional. Where's your everyday average next door American? That's not gonna be on the news because it's ordinary. You're portraying extraordinary. But how, going back to Hall's ideology, thinking about ideology in the media, how do these representations, which go back very far, some of these films go back before, uh, you know, the turn of last century and even before early, early filmmaking. How do these produce the category of the Arab? How is it represented? If you want to speak, you just have to raise your hand so you can take the microphone. Yep, go ahead. How does this construct For the sure, Arab? As terrorists, criminals, uh, very conservative, uh, don't treat women uh, very well. Yeah. yeah. Actually, all the, all the stereotypes that you can target and use any audience for the next time. And are these stereotypes still around today, or have you seen much change in terms of Hollywood? There was also television as well that was featured here. Uh, does it change? I don't know, actually, because I didn't do a, a full scan on the media, especially sure. the foreign media, so I don't know. Uh, but what I believe in, we are in a better place now. That okay. People are fighting the stereotyping, uh, yeah. uh, uh, moving from the extraordinary to ordinary people, so I feel like we are in a better place now, whatever is the media is. Uh, sure. Yeah. And Jack Shaheen's work was part of moving Hollywood to a better place. Right, this critique that he developed two or three decades ago. Unfortunately, he's passed on, but activists like uh, Jalum here are taking up his work and keeping it popular, keeping it popularized, and producing these kinds of videos that then can become tools when we want to talk about ideology and how to deconstruct racism in media. Okay? So I want to move our bus along to the next stop on the tour. to go back here. So patriarchy is not something that the average undergraduate student has a working definition of. And so I often ask my students to read Zaina Zatari's article, which talks about this series, Baba Hera, 
have anybody seen this series, a very se uh, famous Syrian drama? Yes, some people have, okay. This is a Jordanian uh, cartoon artist who's drawn his uh, interpretation of the representations of gender, of patriarchy in this show. Um, here, for the purposes of this room, can anyone offer us a definition of patriarchy? Just raise your hand and uh, Manalo come your way. Maybe someone else just for a second, but thank you. Yes, you have one? Can you come here, Manal, right in the middle in the front? Thank you. Thank you. هو تقسيم اجتماعي بحيث انه يعني بيرتب الافراد في درجات بحيث انه الذكر بيكون هو صاحب الولايه والسلطه المطلقه وبتيجي بعد النساء. So there's an inherent belief in patriarchy that there's a sort of dominance between men over women. And sometimes that can be through exploitation, through oppression, through violence, right? It also affects other men. Patriarchy affects men as well. So this series does a good job of showing us different kinds of patriarchy according to Zatari. She talks about um, different masculinities and the way dominance plays out according to which masculinities are desirable or undesirable. Masculinities that are militarized in the violent defense of the neighborhood, right? And then also a kind of anti-modern masculinity because uh, part of this article deals with the issue of nostalgia. So people thinking back to the past as if it's some sort of wonderful place where men and women, uh, men were men and women were women, right? Uh, but then these are the kinds of representations that don't really match modern day standards. So this is where uh, she thinks about anti-modern masculinity. And so we have a discussion based on this article um, to, to give students some sort of understanding of what patriarchy might be. And then we watch a video together. And it's a short video, I'll play it for you. Um, you might enjoy this one better than the last one. You might find yourself humming along to your favorite wedding music. Okay, sorry, I was told all the files were tested. Joey, what's happening? <laughs> it's just part of the presentation, let's see. Oh, here it is. It was playing. Okay, uh, Fuad, it's playing.
So this video was produced uh, by a student taking media and society with Dr. Jad Melki, and so taking up some of the same issues that we've been talking about from uh, Zatari. How can we think about this video in terms of representations of either undesirable masculinity, militarized masculinity, or anti-modern masculinity? Did you see any examples of those concepts from Zatari in these videos? All of them, yeah, it's true, all of them were there. And some of these songs, everybody knows the words to because they're still played at weddings, they're still played on the radio, they're still on rotation on Rotana. And so these representations of gender are not over. And we don't want to produce students just to be able to critique this stuff, that's great. If they can see it and say, hey, that's sexist, that's patriarchal, that's, that's a really good step forward. What I'm suggesting with my concepts of what radical media education is about is everybody's a media maker today. People have smartphones, people have platforms, people are tweeting, retweeting, everyone's a potential broadcaster. We're sharing lots of messages. Do you really wanna share this kind of content around? Or the content that you saw before? No. And it's still being produced because I'm not blaming the media. Media doesn't exist in a vacuum. Media represents us. These are our oppressions that we create as people, as societies. And we reproduce them in the media we make because the med media and technology, by the way, technology can be racist, technology can be sexist, also are a reflection of us. We build these spaces. And one of the other issues I talk about in uh, media and society here at LAU is the issue of ableism. Does anybody have a definition of ableism? Ableism. Able, from able, yeah, the word able and then ism. So it's the discrimination of people with different abilities because disability is a social construction. All of us are born with different abilities, but physical, intellectual disabilities only become disabilities when society creates spaces, physical spaces, or we create technology where we create differences among people. Because if we build a building with stairs only, then we've created an impossibility for someone with a wheelchair to come to that building. It's not the person with the wheelchair who has the problem, it's the architecture and the design of the building that was a problem. Kindles, people familiar with Kindles, the devices you read books on? It's been for years that blind people who read lots have been asking for a braille-friendly version of Kendall. And it's been in development and prototype for decades, and we still don't have a braille-friendly Kendall. It doesn't mean it's not possible. It is possible. It just has not been done because we create technology, just like we create physical spaces. And how we create it determines who has the ability to access it or not. The same when it comes to representation, Media can construct disabilities in different ways. And so Barnes did a report in 1992, which is unfortunate that we're still talking about these negative representations and stereotypes because they still exist. This is a very popular show on BBC. It's called The Undateables. It shows a pathetic representation of people living with disabilities, following them, on dates that don't work out. Showing them as sexually abnormal. For 10 years this has been on the BBC, despite the fact that people living with disabilities have said this is inappropriate content. So what is more appropriate content when it comes to trying to fight back against ableism in media? I suggest, and others, that we should turn to people living with disabilities in media they produce, or turn to content that features disabilities in non-stereotypical ways. And a great location for that is this international uh, film festival called Real Abilities. This is the directory here. You can go and, re, uh, and view different um, short previews of the films, different trailers. And I'd like to show you one trailer, or sorry, one film, one short film, produced by a woman living with autism. She's nonverbal, except she does communicate. And she's going to show you through her, her film, her language. 
And then she has a translation of her film after, okay? So we're gonna watch an example, again, of media activism, this time produced by someone living with a disability. When you see this, consider these questions. Is this an example of first-person presentation? Too many times, these kinds of negative constructions, these stereotypes, oppressive media, it are people who are constructing others, right? When we think of Edward Said and Jack Shaheen's work, we can think of Orientalism, the construction of the East by the West. So is this an example of first person? So not someone doing a film about someone with a disability or a TV show about people living with disabilities, but someone who has a disability producing a film. The second is, is this a kind of visual activism? Is there something here that's transformative about the way we think about the world, how to be represented in film, visual representation? Think about that question. And then aesthetic reprogramming. Are there ways in which you think that this film challenges the way you think watching films are, or the way you think communication is? So think about these questions as we watch the short film. Again, in my language, by Amanda Baggs, features as, featured as part of the content of the Real Abilities Film Festival. The previous part of this video was in my native language. Many people have assumed that when I talk about this being my language, 
That means that each part of the video must have a particular symbolic message within it, designed for the human mind to interpret. But my language is not about designing words or even visual symbols for people to interpret. It is about being in a constant conversation with every aspect of my environment, reacting physically to all parts of my surroundings. In this part of the video, the water doesn't symbolize anything. I am just interacting with the water as the water interacts with me. Far from being purposeless, the way that I move is in a going response to what is around me. Ironically, the way that I move when responding to everything around me is described as being in a world of my own, whereas if I interact with a much more limited set of responses and only react to a much more limited part of my surroundings, people claim that I am opening up to true interaction with the world. They judge my existence, awareness and personhood on which of a tiny and limited part of the world I appear to be reacting to. The way I naturally think and respond to things looks and feels so different from standard concepts or even visualization that some people do not consider it thought at all, but it is a way of thinking in its own right. However the thinking of people like me is only taken seriously if we learn your language, no matter how we previously thought or interacted. As you heard, I can sing along to what is around me. It is only when I type something in your language that you refer to me as having communication. I smell things. I listen to things. I feel things. I taste things. I look at things. It is not enough to look and listen and taste and smell and feel. I have to do those to the right things, such as look at books and fail to do them to the wrong things. Or else people doubt that I am a thinking being. And since their definition of thought defines their definition of person but so ridiculously much, they doubt that I am a real person as well. I would like to honestly know how many people, if you met me on the street, would believe I wrote this. I find it very interesting by the way that failure to learn your language is seen as a deficit, but failure to learn my language is seen as so natural that people like me are officially described as mysterious and puzzling rather than anyone admitting that it is themselves who are confused, not autistic people or other cognitively disabled people who are inherently confusing. We are even viewed as non-communicative if we don't speak the standard language. But other people are not considered non-communicative if they are so oblivious to our own languages as to believe they don't exist. In the end I want you to know that this has not been intended as a voyeuristic freak show where you get to look at the bizarre workings of the autistic mind. It is meant as a strong statement on the existence and value of many different kinds of thinking and interaction in a world where how close you can appear to a specific one of them determines whether you are seen as a real person, or an adult, or an intelligent person, and in a world in which those determine whether you have any rights, there are people being tortured, people dying, because they are considered non-persons because their kind of thought is so unusual as to not be considered thought at all. Only when the many shapes of personhood are recognized will justice and human rights be possible. So again, In My Language, produced, directed, shot by uh, uh, Amanda Bags. She uh, featured this film as part of the Real Abilities Film Festival, as I mentioned before, which is a site of other films like this. Again, not voyeuristic freak shows, which was one of the stereotypes that uh, Barnes talked about in his review of British television, or like the, un the uh, undateables, the uh, example that I showed you before, but something different, right? A kind of visual 
activism of sorts. But what do you think? Is this an example of first person presentation? Right, she shot it, it's from her point of view. Um, and in terms of visual act, uh, activism or aesthetic reprogramming, do you see anything in the film that causes you to think about either visualization, film production differently or communication differently? Do you have a kind of aesthetic reprogramming that happened because of viewing this, you can now think differently about communication and think differently about who can or cannot produce film. Would anybody like to comment on that? The difference they experience now after watching this film? You have something? Manal? Thank you. فيديو تتناول يمكن اهم مشكله بيواجهها الاشخاص اللي بالعالم دول الشباب سواء الطيف التوحد اللي هي التواصل يمكن لازم تكون هيك اه سوري اي واز تراين تو هير يو بت ذن اتس توكينج كوايت سو ام هافينغ ا هارد تايم هيرينج بيون ممكن اي انديرستاند ممكن اوكي الفيديو يمكن تتناول اهم مشكله بيواجهها الاشخاص دول الاعاقه من دول الشباب الطيف التوحد اللي هي التواصل بشكل رئيسي تتناول انا ما بفهم Yeah, just a second. What channel do I need to be on for English? Two? I was on, that's French. Okay, got it. Yeah. Try. Okay. The video is about the problem of the people who are from 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 the people who are زي المشهد اللي فتح فيه الفيلم اللي هو رصرصه الايدين هاي من اهم او من اكثر الحركات انتشارا السلوكيات انتشارا عند عند الاشخاص ذوي الاعاقه تحديدا التوحد وهي يمكن لها لها تعبيرات للاشخاص الدارسين او اللي بيعرفوا بالتحليل النفسي غالبا بيكونوا هم سعداء في هاي اللحظه او غالبا بدهم يحكوا شيء معين كمان الملمس عند الاشخاص من ذوي التوحد إلها إلها تفاصيل وإلها معاني فكرة كيف إنه حاول يلمس كل شيء بالغرفة فكرة الحركة النمطية والحركة المتكررة في في المشاهد كانت رسائل الفيلم كثير واضحة والنص اللي الفويس أوفر اللي كان موجود في نهاية في النصف الثاني من الفيلم شرح مجموعة أشياء يمكن ما كانتش كثير واضحة للكل بس أنا بعتقد إنه الرسالة الرسالة وصلت منه بشكل كثير سلس وبسيط و زي ما حكينا يمكن موضوع الانتاج ما ما كان لازم يكون كثير حدا متخصص اللي عم بنتج بس قدر يوصل رساله يمكن غالبا تصوير تليفون بموبايل مش يعني مش بكاميرات مش بعدد يعني مهمه My battery died like twice but it's okay I heard most of what you said um, so I would agree that there is a difference uh, with regard to watching this film and seeing what it's what what is being documented but it's not always for the benefit of the public that they have the kind of medical experience that you're speaking of when it comes to people who work with people who live with autism to know these kinds of things about their communicative abilities because those people have been trained in the languages of the wide spectrum of autism, right? So this kind of film opens it up for broader audiences, these ideas, and for some, we might have been raised to look at someone with a disability and look the other way. And that's why this is a aesthetic reprogramming because we're invited into Amanda's room, house, and we see the world from her point of view because this is a first person film, right? It's not a film about her, it's a film by her. And above and beyond that, it's a film with a strong statement. And it's a statement about communication. And this is very important for students of communication to recognize that some scholars think we ought to rename the field, not as the study of communication, but the study of participation. Because some people who are called non-communicative are locked away, or violence are committed against them, or they're considered non-persons, right? So without having the right to communicate, which has been a right since the 1970s, enshrined in the Arabic Human Rights uh, Charters here as well, 
right? This right is not given to everybody equally, especially when there's an absence of first-person portrayals, especially when there's a prevalence of racism in the media, of sexism and patriarchy in the media, and of ableism, because these are constructions, right? The media constructs this. Our job as radical media educators, as critical media educators, is not just to teach students to be critical, to deconstruct, but also to create media that does not perpetuate this and other oppressions in media. So one last thing I wanna speak to is from a local social movement here in Beirut, in Lebanon, called Helm. Uh, they produced two short uh, PSAs, and I'd like to play them both for you. And Mandor writes about the impact of this kind of media activism, where sexuality, which is policed here in Lebanon, has been challenged, and institutional homophobia was challenged specifically around a case where a reporter from MTV, Joe Malouf, stated that there should be uh, a roundup of people in this one location where he went undercover and tried to expose some sort of scandal. And he said those people should be taken in by the police. Those people should be jailed. Those people should be policed. And he was calling basically for violence against these people, because they have a sexuality that is not heteronormative. And so he took this space in the media and his report and made this call, but that resulted in other media, and specifically media activists on social media, calling out Joe Malouf for promoting violence against people who live with non-heteronormative sexual identities. So I'll play these two videos for you and then we can talk about how they might be trying to shift not just media discourse on sexuality but social discourse and representations of sexuality and how they're seeking to challenge not just the institution of the police who have the right to police sexuality in Lebanon but of social policing of sexuality. Again, media activism coming from a social movement used in the classroom to talk about how sexuality is constructed, how some sexualities are considered normal and some not. So there are two short videos. I'll play one first and then uh, followed by the other. <laughs> بس في مجتمع عم يقبل إن ضرب إن هين إن حبس واختصب وحتى إن قتل ما تكون جزء منه التقبل هو اللي بيبني المجتمعات الكره هو اللي بيوصل للإرهاب التقبل ببلش من عندك ومن عندك الرهاب إرهاب تميز ما تميز Again, two short videos produced by Halam here in, uh, in Lebanon doing great work on, uh, against homophobia here. So let's talk about this whenever it comes to shifting discourse. Is this an example of uh, trying to change, trying to shift the discourse in media 
on sexuality? What about these videos try to get people to change the kind of meaning, change the, the way of talking, speaking about sexuality? Thoughts? السؤال الامر متعلق بنوع المجتمع الامر متعلق بنوع المجتمع مجتمع لبنان اعتقد انه يعني عنده قيم ومبادئ تختلف عن المجتمعات في بلدان اخرى ويعني لديهم ثوابت معينه لديهم يعني مرتكزات يرتكز عليها المجتمع في التعاملات في فيما بين افراد المجتمع فما من الممكن انه نعمم حاله في مجتمع من مجتمع Sure. Uh, I don't think the question is about generalization. That's a good comment. Um, but to bring it back to the question that's being asked, how do these videos produced in Lebanon by Lebanese activists who live with different sexualities try to shift the way media and the way society, right, because these are not just directed at media practitioners like Joe, Joe Malouf at uh, MTV, how is it trying to change the way media talk about sexuality? What change is being made? You had a comment there? I think that all the media that was presented, whether it was this or not, I think that they always use the attitude so that they can allow the future or the viewer to accept the other. But in terms of the truth, زواجية الجنس دائما ما في رسالة إعلامية عم بتخاطب الناس من ناحية علمية كل الـ 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 الناس عم بكون من عم بتفكر بأنه طبيعة الطبيعة اللي خلق عليها الإنسان ذكر وأنثى رسالة إعلامية عم تفتقد أنها تخاطب الناس بالعقل هل يعانوا هاي الفئة هاي من من مرض نفسي هل خلقوا بطريقة مختلفة هذا الشيء اللي رسالة إعلامية عموما ما بتجاوب عليها لكن تلجأ زي اللي شفناه للعاطفة ومحاولة تقبل الآخر عن طريق إنه هو مظلوم فقط فأعتقد إنه الرسائل ناقصة نوعا ما Sure. We have a comment in the back and a comment in the front. Maybe come to the front first, and then we'll go to the back. Thank you for that. So again, the question is, are there ways in which these advertisements from Alam try to shift the discourse on sexuality? Go ahead. I have a comment. I will talk in English. Uh, there is some ethics that uh, the media has to teach, and especially uh, to motivate the youth to fight against judging appearances and focusing and to put the light on essential issues, the issues related to the life of, to the life of people, because we, we, we saw many things that, are, uh, that threatened uh, life of people, such as the environment sure. crisis in, in Lebanon. So, uh, and also it is not related to uh, the Occidental or the Oriental culture. It should be a worldwide culture. Thank you. Appreciate that. There's one more comment that we'll take in the back, and then we'll move on to uh, an ex exercise that I have for you in a second. يعطيك العافية أنا بعتقد إنه قبل ما نحكي عن هذا الموضوع في موضوع أهم يعني من حيث المبدأ أصلاً فكرة الجنس والثقافة الجنسية بالعالم العربي هي غير موجودة. فاحنا بالدرجه الاولى انه احنا بدنا نحاول ان نتعاطى مع هاي الفئه او انه بدنا فعليا نوصل لفكره معينه يفترض انه يكون الاعلام العربي فعليا عنده مش سقف عالي عنده وضع طبيعي ان الجنس هو زيه زي السياسه زي الاقتصاد زي غيره وبعدين بيتم الانتقال لهذا الموضوع مشان يتم معالجته بطريقه مهنيه وبطريقه تكون هي فعليا علميه شكرا sure that's a great suggestion as well um, I want to mention that I teach another class here called Communication and Gender. 
Uh, and so we take up the issue of sexuality and how it's communicated, historically even, in the Arab region. And so there's some great texts that we look at there. And so if you're interested in different ways sexuality has been expressed and communicated in the Arab region throughout time, uh, you might uh, have a look at that syllabus. And we'll be making syllabi in our department available online, I believe, um, very shortly. So if you're interested in it, you can always contact me directly. Um, so one other thing is to show you an activity before I ask you to do your own activity. After presenting about these different forms of oppression, one of the things that I often ask students to do in my class is to think about how they can plan their own media campaign or their own media production to push back against some of these oppressions. And I give them as an example, in addition to all the examples we just watched, uh, Radio Free Palestine. Radio Free Palestine is a project that was part of co-founding in North America because the Zionist perspective is predominant, is hegemonic in North America, and rarely do you see first-person presentation of the Palestinian point of view. And we carved out a space. Initially, we were just seven community radio stations producing this show. It's a 24-hour marathon on the day of the Nakba, May 15th commemorating, reflecting, and continuing to resist colonial settlerism in Palestine and in media. And it's very important to do this work in Canada because Canada historically, not only is it a colonial settler state that's still waging a very active territorial war to claim land and resources from indigenous people, but Canada historically has had a relationship with the foundation of the state of Israel. And there's a great book on the relationship between Canada and Israel by Eve Engler. And so it's really important to acknowledge that this show was a response to oppression in the media that marginalized the Palestinian perspective within radio, within media in Canada. And so as a way to flip the media system, to transform it from being hegemonic, from promoting oppression of Palestinian experiences. We created the show so that the majority experience on this show for 24 hours is the Palestinian perspective. To balance the airways from all the Zionist media and perspectives that are given all throughout the year, this one day a year for 24 hours, it's Palestinian only. And so this year we were able to, to yet again, produce this show across five continents with producers, across five continents with radio stations, more than 13 hours in Arabic, uh, same in English, uh, French and Spanish content. So this is an exercise I give students to think about how are you going to flip the media system? And so they work in groups and they plan things or sometimes in uh, bigger classes, like semester long classes, they'll actually take time to produce things. So go back to your definition of media literacy. I'm done driving the bus. I want you to get on the microphone and tell me, after you revise, review, reflect just a minute on the definition that you wrote before, what is media literacy? See if you want to revise that definition. See if you want to write a totally different definition. And then prepare to share your answer with the group. Let's hear from a vast majority of you, perhaps some of you who have yet uh, to speak. What's your definition now, after this presentation, after these examples that I've used in the classroom, that I've used in workshops here? What's your definition now of media literacy? So just a moment to review, revise. Review, reflect, and revise, and then we'll do a go around. Oh, you want it this for both sides? So who would like to go first? Would anybody like to share their revised definition of media literacy? So, Joey got there first. <laughs> Uh, there's one here. Or did you want to go? Yeah. Share your, your definition. Yeah. Uh, 
انه يمكن اعطي تعريف ثاني هي محاوله تحويل هيمنه وسائل بعض التواصل الاجتماعي يعني تغيير مسارها انه في بعض الوسائل عليها لها هيمنه على بعض المواقع ممكن نحكي هي طرق تفسير الظواهر والاحداث واخراجها في اطار اعلامي من وجهه نظر مختلفه ولاهداف مختلفه Don't be shy. Everybody gets to talk. We have 10 more minutes. القدرة على قراءة الرسائل الإعلامية بصورة أقرب للحقيقة. Media literacy is the process where we can work with associations, parliaments, international. communities or organizations to eliminate all kind of abuses plus to to be serious to to, to put sanctions in this field okay. so critical practices could also come before sanctions right like teaching criticality like this in this way through practice not just theory but through practice is also important because if you just sanction, then you're just doing band-aids and punitive measures, right? We need to give people a chance from the start, from, from the first time they step into school. Lots of babies have already had iPads and iPhones in their hands, right? But where's the media literacy training opportunities? Right, Manal? Uh, تعريفي في البداية قبل المحاضرة كان إنه إكساب الشخص المهارات والأدوات اللازمة كي يتعامل مع وسائل الاعلام المختلفه كمتلقي ومنتج لكن يعني بعد المحاضره وبعد الفيديوهات اللي شفناها يعني ممكن ندخل بالضبط ايش هي الادوات والمهارات يعني انه لازم يكون في جزء من المهارات الحياتيه مثل تقبل الذات معرفه انا بالاول شو بدي تقبل الاخر وكيف اتعامل مع الاخر وشو مفهومي للاخر وانه التغيير يعني يعني انه المهارات اللي انا بدي اياها انها فعلا يكون فيها تغيير ايجابي مش بس فقط اعطيه الادوات والمهارات وما ينتج شيء في تغيير ايجابي للمجتمع. I think that's great that you gave your previous definition and then your revised definition if people could do that 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 really matches uh, the assignment before us. Uh, but thank you for that shift and that modification. I think that's a really awesome definition. Go ahead. ايضا بتوقع انه التربيه الاعلاميه من خلال انا حصلت حصلت هذا التعريف من بعد ما شفنا الفيديو والبرزنتيشن انها قادره على احداث الفرق من خلال رسائل قصيره قويه واضحه بتلامس الواقع وبتلفت النظر للامور والقضايا المهمه لانه البروباغندا دائما بتكون بتشير للمواضيع اللي مش مهمه لحتى تلفت نظر الناس لها فمن خلال التربيه الاعلاميه ممكن نحدث هذا الامر صح. I think what's also important too is to go back to some of the terminology we looked at at the start of the presentation, definitions of media literacy, recognizing the critique that uh, Melky had put forward that we shouldn't just import concepts, that we need to root them in local issues and local needs and local practices. And that's what's really great about this presentation because it draws in different examples of local activism, local social movements, uh, draws on local representations or representations that people might care about here to be able to teach media literacy. It's not just an importation. Um, so that's important as well. You wanted to speak? Go ahead. للتربية الإعلامية الخروج عن النمطية محاولة فهم ما هي الرسالة الإعلامية المراد إيصالها للمستمع ومن صنع هذه الرسالة الإعلامية ولماذا صنعها وما هو الهدف معي بعيد المدى لهذه الرسالة This would be the, the impact of ideology that Hall talked about, right? Like the criminalization of race. It's not just understanding the critique of how race is presented, it's also about the impact of that on those racialized bodies. There's a reason why Arabs are stopped at the airport. There's a reason why um, the average American walking on the street doesn't know the difference between Palestine and Pakistan, right? <laughs> so some of this is because of Hollywood's representations, and I'm sorry, Aladdin is still wrong. They still got it wrong, <laughs> even if it's revised and new.
شكرا لك اول شيء كان التعريف للتربيه الاعلاميه بالنسبه لك عرفته بطريقه محدوده بعد ما حضرنا الفيديوهات صار شامل واوسع فانا باعتقادي انه التربيه الاعلاميه القدره على المتابعه وتحليل وتقييم المحتوى والقدره على توصيل رسائل عبر الوسائل الاعلاميه المختلفه وطبعا التربيه الاعلاميه لها مبادئ مبنيه عليها اللي اهمها التحقق او ثاني شيء الانتاج المحتوى بعيد عن النمطيه الكراهيه التمييز وايضا طريقه الوصول الى هذا المحتوى شكرا Thank you very much. We have another comment down front and then we'll come in the back, okay? بجوز اللي بضيفه من معلومات بالشق اللي بتعلق فيها بالمشتغل في المجال الاعلامي الصحفي او صانع محتوى موضوع التغيير القناعات قناعات المجتمع والافكار الموجوده عنده بالاضافه انه قيم يعني قيم جديده فعلا بتحاول الماده الصحفيه او بتحاول المحتوى الصحفي ان يوصلها للمجتمع شكرا جوي ويل كم تو يو And, and I totally agree, media is power. Whenever uh, we have my first class, media and society, we do a go around in the room and I ask students, why did you take this course? Don't tell me what you read in the course uh, description, but tell me why did you take this course? And people have to do a go around. Uh, and sometimes uh, I'll even give my own reason of why I teach it. And I teach media because I believe media is power. It can be used to oppress, but can also be a source of empowerment. بالنسبة إلي بعتبر التربية الإعلامية أول شيء لازم نسأل على موضوع تغيير الصورة النمطية بالدرجة الأولى لأنه تغيير الصورة النمطية هو بقودنا مباشرة لبناء صورة ذهنية اللي راح تعكس الآلية الموجودة لأنه اليوم أصلاً هو الإعلام بخدمة العاطفة في الشرق الأوسط والوطن العربي فإحنا نحتاج أكثر لإعلام أو لتربية إعلامية تكون هي بخدمة الإنسان وبخدمة القضايا أو الأمور اللي ممكن هي عم تخدم المجتمع وتخدم البشرية. So thank you all for your comments, your definitions, for sitting in this room, for taking in this content. I know some of it was quite offensive. Some of it hopefully was inspiring. I have a list of references. This will be made available. Sah, Annie, this will be on the MD Lab website. Yes. Um, so you can read all of these references. They are open access, meaning you don't have to be at LAU or in a university to read some of this content. And if there's something missing, um, If you want to know more, if you want to see the media and society syllabus that we've developed here after years and years of teaching uh, media and society in this region, then please just ask. We're not hard to find. Um, yeah, thank you all very much, and I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow at the free media discussion. Have a great coffee break. <laughs>